looking at breaking news from the bottom of your screen that uh, Israel's Nevatim Air Base in the Negev Desert has been struck by Iranian missiles. Now, this is being reported, I believe, from the Israeli side of things. We also have had reports uh, basically uh, saying that uh, the Israeli media uh, is not allowed to show um, the videos or the footage of the uh, Iranian missiles hitting um, and exploding. So, of course, we, there, there are lots of uh, uh, videos online because, of course, of people and their cameras and filming it and uh, putting it on social media. So, uh, let me see. Do I still have Tim with me? No, I do not. I'm going to cross over. I am really sorry. I am not sure who I have with me. I see your image. Here we go. It's on the way. Larry Johnson, former CIA analyst out of Bradenton. Thanks so much for being with us. Sorry about the confusion. It is live TV, and we're rolling with it by the minute. Thank you so much for being with us. Your thoughts, Larry, uh, about the importance of this retaliatory attack and what it means for the United States not to get involved or if it gets involved? Well, it has certainly provided a wake-up call to uh, the United States and Israel. I mean, it's, it, they were predicting a, an attack this week. I'm not sure they anticipated something this large, this extensive. But at the same time, uh, this was not the full exercise of Iran's military capability. Uh, this was, I think, ex expressed, and, I, and I'm not sure if there were any conversations behind scenes where the actual dimensions of the attack were described to either the Russians, the Chinese, the United States, that, you know, we'll, let's call it kabuki theater, where Iran can launch the attack, it can hit the military targets, and then, as the Iranian ambassador to the UN has said, then, you know, if there's no further response from Israel, we'll call it a day, we'll call it even. Now, these strikes clearly don't make up for the lives lost on the part of the uh, Iranian people, but it's nonetheless within the world of international uh, politics, it may have been sufficient. Uh, but what what Israel was shown today is that Iran has it in its capability to launch a combined arms attack using drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles. Each has a different speed. Each can arrive at a different time. So if if they're if they're fired in a staggered manner, so that they all arrive at the same time, there probably is no air defense system in the world, much less in Israel, that can withstand that. And uh, what was uh, I had written about this last night uh, at Sonar21.com, noting that I did not think that uh, Iran would resort to attacking diplomatic facilities, because it made a very strong point in its presentation to the UN Security Council last week that that was a violation of the Vienna Convention. It shows how Iran has you know, grow, grown up in the last 45 years since they stormed uh, the American embassy in Tehran in 1979. And so I think Iran was not going to lower itself to doing what Israel did. The unfortunate thing is the UN Security Council, with the United States, the United Kingdom, and France in the lead, refused to condemn Israel's violation of the 1961 Vienna Convention. And I think Iran naturally was left in a position of, if you're not going to uphold your own international rules-based order, how in the name of God are we supposed to sit here and be taking casualties and get beaten upon by this lawless regime in Jerusalem? So uh, that, that's what I think, you know, laid the foundation for the strike today. Yet it was measured, even though it's being touted in the West as something very extreme, it, it certainly was not Iran showing all of its cards. Now Israel, true to form, is claiming it's going to strike back on Iranian territory. Uh, they would be well advised not to. It is a stupid, foolish move because Iran has the ability to escalate 
and to inflict damage in a way that Israel has never experienced. That, that's part, I, you know, candidly part of the reason Israel has gotten away with being this, you know, neighborhood bully, where they're always, you know, it's easy to kill unarmed Palestinians. It's easy to bomb states and nations like Lebanon, which don't really have a, an adequate yeah. air defense or a robust military, or Syria, which is on its hills. But once they come up against an actual military that can strike back and strike back with power, all of a sudden Israel's not prepared to fight that. And, and what I do, uh, what I fear is that uh, this is going to now escalate, that uh, Israel will not hold back, it will strike, and Iran in turn will be compelled to do as was uh, stated in the previous interview. They will up the ante and uh, can deliver a very large strike, not just on military facilities, but on uh, key cities in Israel. Bring the war home to the Israeli people in the same way that the people of Gaza have suffered. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Now we have breaking news that uh, is saying that uh, Iran is saying that it, the fight or the uh, the conflict is between Iran and Israel, and Correct. the U.S. should stay away. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, they should. Uh, the United States should steer clear of it, but it's not going to. It's a political year. Uh, there's enormous political pressure in the United States, and, and candidly, the United States has been itching to go to war with Iran for a long time. Now, once again, the United States, like Israel, has not learned any lessons from recent history. Uh, we are now approaching the six-month period in the war uh, against the Houthis in Yemen. And the United States has failed, utterly failed, to reopen the Red Sea and to squash the Houthi military effort. Well, the, frankly, the, the Houthis are a flea compared to the Iran and its military power. And if the United States cannot do deal effectively with someone as inconsequential or some country as inconsequential as Yemen. How in the world do they suppose that they're going to be able to confront, defeat, or, or deal with Iran? It's just, it's delusional. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think people need to take Iran at face value. It's not exaggerating. It's not lying. It's not just... Uh, you know, doing hot air, claiming to do something with no intention of acting. I, I think, candidly, Iran has been very, very, very patient up to this point. You know, going back to you know the early 2010, 2011, when you're when Iranian nuclear scientists were being assassinated, and and all this at a time when the United States decided to become a sponsor of terrorism by sponsoring the group, uh, the Mujahideen al Khalq. MEK. And then that was followed up uh, with these other terrorist attacks and, you know, what I believe is uh, direct support to groups in Balochistan. So uh, throughout all of this, Iran has been very patient and has not uh, voiced outwardly that it was going to up the ante. Uh, but I think it's uh, I think the Iranian patience has worn off and it's uh, sending a very clear message to the United States and Israel that this war right now is between Israel and Iran, but if the United States intervenes, the United States will suffer the consequences. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember in 1983 when the United States intervened back then in the war that was raging in Lebanon and began shelling uh, Hezbollah positions in the Baqa Valley. And the aftermath of that was the bombing of the U.S. Embassy and the Marine, what was known as the Marine Barracks, and the killing of, uh, uh, of uh, d dozens of Marines. So that's where the United States learned that if it sticks its nose there into those kinds of conflict, it can get its nose bloodied. Mr. Johnson, uh, I wanted you to know your thoughts on Iran's defense minister, his comments, uh, Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Ashtiani issued a stark warning uh, to any country that allows Israel to <clears throat> utilize its airspace or territory uh, for attacking Iran, saying they will face a decisive response from Iran. Yeah, I, I take him at face value. I saw that Turkey vowed that it would not allow uh, its airspace to be used. 
uh, I think a couple of the Gulf states as well. Uh, Jordan did not. And so uh, Jordan, uh, you know, could face some potential repercussions. Uh, Iraq, I think, has made it clear that it's not going to allow its country to be used. So uh, those that, that creates some real logistical nightmares for both the United States and, and uh, Israel in wanting to retaliate against Iran on land. Uh, but that doesn't prevent the use of submarines. Both the United States and Israel have submarines that can be used to launch missiles. But I also know that uh, Iran uh, is conducting joint military exercises with China and Russia over the last four years. And I don't think it would be out of line to ask Russia and China for assistance in tracking submarines to make sure that a submarine attack is not a viable option. Mr. Johnson, you, uh, you mentioned Russia. Uh, I think there were reports on uh, Vladimir Putin saying or telling uh, or asking uh, uh, America or the U.S. to stay out of it. Your thoughts on that, sir? Yeah, well, I think he, he's uh, recognizing that if the United States decides to intervene, Russia may have to intervene as well as China. And you, you try to put the United States on notice so that they will be aware of what some of the potential consequences are. But the United States doesn't care. You know, there were, well, unfortunately, we we're being led by a president who has, you know, meant mentally incapacitated and as such is not capable of making sound, wise decisions. Certainly not in a mood to find a way to defuse the situation, to ratchet down the tensions, to make sure that there's separation now between Iran and Israel. But this does not escalate. Uh, I, I think we're headed into a very, very dangerous time where this escalation could get out of hand. Mr. Johnson, what about the, we've also talked about the U.S. Uh, do you think uh, the, the Israeli regime would have started this uh, onslaught on, uh, the, on the Gazans, on Palestine, more than 30-something thousand people killed, <coughs> the rest are buried under the rubble, some of them. Uh, the atrocities, the onslaught, would, it, would the Israeli regime have done this if it weren't for the ironclad support by the U.S. and some Western countries? No, no, they would be unable to do so. They could have started, and the United States was certainly in, in a unique position to tell them, hey, cut it out or you're not getting any more money. You're not getting any more weapons. Uh, that, that did not happen. As a result, uh, Israel was basically giving a carte blanche uh, full power to do what it wanted. And it has certainly exercised that power to the detriment of the deaths of more than 33,000 Palestinian, the majority of whom are women and children. Mr. Johnson, uh, is the Israeli regime hoping that uh, the U.S. will help them again? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I, in fact, I think they're sort of counting on getting the United States embroiled in an actual shooting war with Iran. But the, question is, uh, but the question is, would the U.S. intervene this time? Uh, very, very likely. It's, it's certainly a potential. Uh, the, the power of the um, Israeli lobby through the Israeli uh, Political uh, Public uh, Affairs Committee, I, uh, uh, you know, that, that group coupled with... Uh, a long-standing hatred for Iran that's been, it's sort of a propaganda meme um, that, you know, the United States has short-term short memory loss. They, they don't remember the origins of this with the U.S. intervention, what was it, 1953, overthrowing the government of Mossadegh, uh, forcing him out through a coup, and, and then ultimately uh, his death. Um, you know, there, there's a long history there. The United States only sees one side of it, most of the people, unfortunately. They only see Iran as a terrorist state, Iran as a, a fanatical religious regime, and uh, the, the United States takes no responsibility whatsoever for um, the, the, the consequences of its actions in the region. Mr. Johnson, what could we expect if the U.S. gets directly involved? We know that they are involved, but they get directly involved. What could we expect? 
Uh, I would expect some uh, cruise missile launches from submarines on oil facilities. Uh, I'm hoping it doesn't go that far. Uh, at this point, they may be inclined to try to boost Israel's air defense capabilities. But the fact of the matter is the United States doesn't really have effective systems, notwithstanding the constant hype about the Patriot missile battery. Um, so uh, un unless, the, unless the United States decides to attack into Iran proper with missiles and some airstrikes, maybe with aircraft, uh, I think they'd be ill-advised to use aircraft because Iran is not a rock. Iran has significant air defense systems that could shoot that down. Um, they they could they could really run the risk of uh, enabling Israel to do to, you know to carry out those attacks inside Iran as well. So th that's what I mean when I say this thing can get out of control because it's an election year. Joe Biden's in a place where he can't afford to look weak, and so he's. The opposite of that is it's like it's like the bully who has to prove himself that he's tougher than he really is by picking out the weakest person possible to beat up. And in this case, they may make the mistake of um, not understanding that Iran is not weak, that Iran, is, uh, I think the West has mistaken Iran's restraint up to this point for weakness. And that's, uh, I, I think, a potentially fatal mistake. Mr. Johnson, what would it take for this not to further escalate into a wider regional war? Uh, it would take the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, France, China, and Russia, all five members of the UN Security Council, to get together to agree that they're going to put a stop to this. That uh, the stop will be Israel will immediately cease military operations in Gaza, in the West Bank, and in, in Lebanon in exchange for uh, China and Russia will guarantee that uh, Iran will shut down its military operations. Barring that, I think uh, we're headed to war. Mr. Johnson, uh, I wanted to know your uh, thoughts on this as well. Uh, Iran says its attack on Israel concludes a matter of Israel attack on its embassy, and mm -hmm. Iran's mission to the UN says uh, that uh, its drone, a missile attack on Israel, was conducted on the strength of Article 51 of the UN Charter pertaining to uh, its legitimate defense and in response to right, Israel's right, April 1 attack. Right. right. Yeah. No, that's I Listen, this, I think this would have been prevented if the United States, the United Kingdom, and France more than a week ago had supported the Russian resolution presented at the UN Security Council condemning Israel for an illegal uh, attack on the uh, annex, uh, the, the diplomatic annex of uh, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran in Damascus. And, and instead of upholding the Vienna Convention from 1961, uh, the, those three members of the UN Security Council essentially uh, did the equivalent of defecating on it. They, they shamed it. They disgraced it. And they the left no option uh, for uh, Iran but to defend itself. You know, this is, like I said, this could have been prevented. The West didn't want to prevent it because the West exaggerates their own capabilities. Um, one of the things I think that definitely could come out of this uh, is, you know, if, if it escalates in the region, that uh, Iran may be compelled to shut down the movement of all oil, at least oil headed for the United States and for anybody else connected with Israel or the United States. Mr. Shut Joseph, that down. That would ahead, be Mr. important. Mr. Johnson, thank you for your time, sir. We'll talk to you again. Now, uh, I'll right. be reading a statement by Iran's foreign ministry. It says that the armed forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran in exercising Iran's inherent right to legitimate defense as stipulated on, in Article 51 of the United Nations Charter and in response to the repeated military aggressions of the Zionist regime and the martyrdom of Iran's official military advisors who were active in that country upon invitation by the Syrian uh, government, particularly the military attack on April 1 on our diplomatic locations in Damascus, 
uh, carried out a series of attacks against the military bases of this regime on April 14th. The Islamic, the Islamic Republic of Iran, while retaining, uh, reiterating its commitment to the principles and objectives of the United Nations Charter and international law, emphasizes its determination to decisively defend the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and national interests against any illegal use of force and aggression. It further says that the, uh, the recourse of the Islamic Republic of uh, Iran to uh, defensive actions uh, in exercising the right to legitimate defense is indicative of Iran's responsible approach towards regional and international peace and security at a time when illegal actions and genocide by the occupying apartheid Zionist regime against the Palestinian nation and the regime's repeated military aggressions against neighboring states and its warmongering in the region and beyond continue. The Islamic Republic of Iran will not hesitate to take further defensive actions to protect its legitimate interests against any military aggressive acts and illegal use of force if necessary. Those were the comments by Iran's foreign statements by Iran's foreign ministry. Now, uh, I think we have Gisou Misha Ahmadi with us uh, from Tehran. Uh, to get uh, the latest updates. Gisu, over to you. Well, I'm uh, just back from the streets of Tehran where we were just talking. Uh, so as you know, people came out on the streets only minutes after the news broke out to express their support for the IRGC retaliatory attack uh, and of course uh, support for the Palestinian nation and particularly those in Gaza. Uh, well, uh, it was uh, a very festive mood actually on the streets of Tehran. So many happy faces. Whole families in many cases were out on the streets. Uh, fathers and uh, mothers and children were out together holding both flags of uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran and also the flag of Palestine. And all of them were saying one thing, that they are happy that finally the IRGC has responded to these attacks. Many of them were saying, Mehdi, that they were expecting uh, such attacks a lot sooner. But, well, this time the Israeli regime really crossed a very big red line and it had to have a decisive response right there. And uh, therefore, they were actually very supportive of uh, the attacks, uh, the retalia uh, retaliatory attacks of the IRGC. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the crowd first gathered in front of Tehran University. It started with a group of students uh, who came out from the dormitories uh, near Tehran University. And as they gathered, we saw people coming out from their homes to join in. And later on, they marched uh, towards uh, the British Embassy, uh, which was about uh, four or five blocks away. And uh, the reason why they chose the British Embassy, Mehdi, I have to tell you, is because many of them expressed uh, their total disappointment at uh, the British government, which not only has not condemned the attack on the consular section of uh, Iran in Damascus, uh, but also it still has the Ukrainian flag, which uh, it was quite visible from the other side of the street. And that is uh, beside the fact that there is no flag in support of the Palestinian nation for seven months now. Uh, they are being bombarded constantly. And, well, we do know that more than 33,000 Palestinians have been killed so far, many of them women and children. So they were also asking what happened to human rights. As you said, uh, the British embassy, because we don't have a U.S. embassy in Iran. Now, Gisu, uh, the, the breaking news that uh, you can see on the, uh, your screens, uh, UN Security Council is to hold an emergency meeting on Iran's reprisal operation. So, Gisu, what, what could we expect? Well, we do know that Antonio Guterres has uh, actually uh, called for um, restraint uh, on both sides because, in his words, uh, neither the region nor the world has the capacity for another war. Uh, so we could expect uh, what's happening in this particular meeting is to try to de-escalate the tensions uh, that uh, exist right now.
Angisu, uh, what about uh, the reports that we see? The first one was Rishi Sunak condemning Iran's, uh, as they say, attack on Israel, but as uh, Iran says, it's a reprisal attack. Your thoughts on uh, those leaders that still support the Zionist or the Israeli regime? Well, uh, Mehdi, interestingly enough, tonight um, I told you that there were some students out on the streets. And uh, interestingly enough, I came across a group of international students who were studying in Iran, well, different majors, not necessarily related to international politics or anything. But uh, it was interesting for me, first of all, to see them out on the streets because they were not Iranians. Uh, but they were still out in support of Palestine. And also what they were saying, some of them were from the United States, others from European countries. And what they were saying is that this shows the true colors of those governments uh, that claim to be advocates of human rights. And also, let's not forget that the IRGC has also condemned the uh, British silence and inaction towards the attack on Iran's consular section uh, in Syria and Damascus, which is completely against uh, the uh, Vienna Conventions. And uh, it is a clear and blatant violation of international law. Uh, the fact that the British government uh, has not condemned this attack basically shows the true colors of this government and also the others who have not taken any sides in um, defending uh, Iran in this case because this could happen to any other country and it would definitely be against the Vienna Conventions. The question is how come when it comes to Iran these governments are silent? Uh, the reports that we had up to now is hundreds of uh, missiles and drones were fired towards Israel. Uh, there were reports that around 50% of the rockets uh, that were fired did reach the designated Israeli targets. Uh, Israeli media also says that at least seven of the missiles hit the Raman air base in Negev Desert, uh, the very base where, uh, from where the Israeli attack was launched on the Iranian embassy in Syria on April 1st, which killed seven, on, uh, seven of Iranian advisory officials, including top I IRGC commander Major General Zahedi. Uh, your thoughts on Iran's might? Well, actually, the fact that Iran was uh, able to target uh, the exact same place where an attack was launched on the consular section of the Iranian embassy in Damascus uh, clearly sends a message to the Israelis that, well, so far Iran has been very patient with Israelis. We do know that these attacks uh, have been uh, ongoing for quite some time. We've had Iranian nuclear scientists assassinated by the Israeli regime. We've had top military officials uh, assassinated by the Israeli regime. But this time, they actually crossed a very big red line by completely undermining international law and the Vienna Convention and attacking uh, diplomatic mission. So it definitely required a strong response, which is why uh, people came out to uh, show their support for the IRGC uh, for the uh, this retaliatory attack. Uh, anyhow, um, you know that for Iranians, tonight is considered a very big night. I have to tell you, while we were out on the streets, we could see some of those uh, missiles that were being fired in the sky and every time people would see one of those they would cheer uh, as loud as they can because this was something that they were waiting for such a long time. And Gisu, uh, I also wanted you to know your thoughts about uh, what Iran says. Iran says this was the, just the first phase uh, of the reprisal attack and uh, further said that if Israel makes another mistake, Iran's response will be much greater. What could we expect from uh, the Zionist or the Israeli regime and in response by Iran? Well, uh, first of all, we do know, uh, according to Israeli media, we've been monitoring uh, media reports and we do know that the Israelis, although they were 
uh, prepared for a retaliatory attack. They were definitely not prepared for an attack of this scale. And uh, it would definitely be a very big mistake to uh, respond to that because Iran did not even use um, a tenth of uh, its uh, military might in this retaliatory attack. We do know from the military drills that we've been covering um, Mehdi over the past uh, couple of years uh, what um, elaborate and state-of-the-art uh, military uh, hardware Iranians have been able to develop uh, fully homegrown and we do know that none of those have yet been used. So uh, for the Israelis, as far as any observer is concerned, that would be opening a can of worms. That's right. Uh, just news coming in. Gisu, Israel's UN envoy requests emergency security council meeting. Ironically, uh, Israel's UN ambassador Gilad Erdan has written to the president of the security council formally requesting an emergency meeting on Iran's uh, reprisal attack. Now, uh, your thoughts on that? Because uh, how come we did not have these from uh, what was happening in Gaza and Palestine? It is actually quite interesting. Basically, what's happened after October the 7th, Mahdi, for observers and the pundits we've been talking to, this is something I've heard time and again ever since the 7th of October, uh, the true colors of uh, the Israeli regime and many Western countries that claim to be advocates of human rights, claim to be law-abiding states, uh, their true colors are now coming out and people all over the world are now uh, getting to know more about these uh, states and even their own people. Interestingly enough, over the past seven months, we've seen some of the biggest pro-Palestine demonstrations in countries that have always traditionally been allies of the Israeli regime. We've had huge demonstrations in uh, different states across the United States, in London, in Paris. And you know, these are countries that well, uh, or considered the allies of the Israeli regime. So even their own nations are now getting to know more about the true position of their governments and the fact that for them, as far as they are concerned, any issues such as international law, ICC, ICJ, uh, uh, war crimes, genocide, human rights, humanitarian uh, crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, all of these expressions for those countries are only political tools. You see, the reason I ask you this question, because I remember that it was, I think it was Netanyahu or one of the officials, Israeli officials, that they downplayed the UN and the UNSC. Exactly. But when it comes to them, everything changes, doesn't it, Mehdi? And we have seen this reoccur time and again. As long as it's something in their favor, they're totally okay with it. They, we have to uphold international law, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, when it comes to something that goes against their interests, it's something that they can completely undermine the way Israel has. We do know that there is a, a provisional ruling right now pending from the ICJ demanding the Israelis to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza. And while the Israelis have not even paid the slightest attention to that provisional ruling, not only that, but they've also attacked more um, aid workers. And only just a, a few days ago, we heard news about uh, seven of those aid workers that were killed in an Israeli attack while they were in a truck that carried a logo on top of it, uh, clearly showing that uh, they are uh, humanitarian aid workers, but still they were attacked by the Israeli regime. And what was the response of Netanyahu? He said, well, it's a war and things like that happen. So when it comes to them, apparently all the rules can be bent, but uh, if it's not in their interest, well, then uh, they definitely want to uh, every other country to abide by international law. Then the Geneva Conventions come in, the Vienna Convention, and all the international rules and regulations that the UN uh, upholds. You see, you also mentioned earlier about uh, the sanctions 
Now, we had decades of sanctions on Iran, obviously by the U.S. and the Western powers. Uh, I want you to talk about the sanctions and how has Iran managed this military prowess? Exactly. You know, tonight was a night, uh, basically I would call it a show of force, because every time there are uh, has been a military drill, and we've been covering those military drills in Press TV for the past 18 years, Mehdi. And every time we see mainstream media, in a way, trying to downplay Iran's uh, military capabilities, its defense capabilities in particular, uh, trying to show that it's really not a big deal. And um, now, tonight, we actually um, saw that in practice, Iran is actually a military power that needs to be taken very seriously. And the most important part, as you mentioned yourself, is that all of the, these capabilities, all the technology acquired, all the hardware, military hardware that has been developed in Iran is fully homegrown. And that also goes to show those mainstream media reports that uh, we hear a lot something about brain drain and the fact that Iran is losing all of its scientists or the younger generation who can actually uh, be of help for the development of the country are leaving. We uh, receive some facts and figures showing that Iran is among the top 10 countries uh, which is suffering from a brain drain. Well, we have a question for uh, those organizations which provide those statistics right now. If there is a drain, brain drain, then who are the people who are developing these uh, military equipment? And well, uh, you know, basically what happened tonight and after the 7th of October in general, showed that so many of the things that we read and hear in all those media reports, so many of them are simply propaganda, Western propaganda against the Islamic Republic of Iran. Isu, I wanted you to give us some info on the resistance forces in the region as well. Obviously, we have uh, the Lebanese, uh, we have Lebanon and the Hezbollah resistance movement. We have uh, other ones in Iraq and Syria, and especially not forgetting Yemen, the Ansarullah, and the Houthis, uh, and they are now a force to reckon with. Yes, definitely. Like I said, and it's not just me saying, uh, we've talked to pundits and everyone is saying that the world after October 7 is a completely different world because uh, the axis of resistance now has shown how uh, powerful it is. and now that they're giving really strong response to the Israeli aggression against the people in Gaza, you see exactly to what extent uh, they can move forward. And of course, the main pillar of the axis of resistance is Iran, which uh, has uh, given them the strength, let's say, uh, with the support that they received from the Islamic Republic of Iran um, to uh, come out and be confident about what they can do in order to uh, move forward with uh, their agenda. Kisu, uh, reports are coming in that uh, foreign officials, I said mostly from the West, are uh, condemning Iran for the, as we say, the reprisal attack. Your thoughts on that? Uh, how come you condemn uh, Iran for a reprisal attack, retaliatory attack, which uh, on April 1st it was uh, on the Iranian embassy, uh, and that is really an attack on the Iranian embassy. And they are condemning Iran for the reprisal attack, which is, uh, which is uh, in a way, Article 51 of the UN Charter pertaining to legitimate defense and in response to Israel's attack. Exactly. I mean, Iran has every right to do this. Definitely, and not just that article you just mentioned. This goes completely against the Vienna uh, Convention and the fact that uh, diplomatic missions should remain immune from uh, military attacks. And the fact that these uh, rules, uh, international law, is completely undermined when it comes to uh, the interests of uh, the 
a Zionist uh, regime or its allies, it basically shows the true colors of this regime. I did point out just a few minutes ago that when we were in front of the British Embassy in Tehran, uh, what could be visible very clearly from the other side of the walls was a Ukrainian flag uh, which uh, showed uh, the support of the British people for Ukraine. So uh, what is the difference between women and children in Ukraine who are being attacked and the women and children in Gaza who are also being attacked? Not to mention that the number of children and people, civilians killed in Gaza is completely uncomparable to the number of people that have been killed since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. But still, it seems that uh, as long as you have uh, blue eyes and blonde hair, there is a certain privilege. As you said, Gisu, they, they are saying that Yvonne is escalating the violence, but uh, what about the Zionist regime? Six, seven months of onslaught on uh, Gaza. Uh, they've killed more than 30, 40,000 plus people, mostly 70% of them women and children. Uh, but they are saying that Yvonne is escalating the violence, uh, but not Israel. Why? Uh, well, that is really an absurd uh, comment because even after the Israelis attacked the consular section of uh, the Iranian embassy in Damascus, we were seeing a lot of media reports and uh, analysis of the situation uh, claiming that Israel on purpose is trying to escalate the situation. So even mainstream media when Israel attacked the consular section of the Iranian embassy in Damascus did admit that this was a move, a provocative move by the Israeli regime and definitely uh, with uh, the objective of escalating the situation and expanding the war in different dimensions. Even we've had pundits uh, who uh, were uh, saying that this uh, was a strategic move by the Israeli regime because they found themselves uh, in a uh, quagmire in Gaza and they needed uh, some kind of deviation of the attention of the international community in order to be able to pull out. And a testimony to that is tonight. Let's not forget that tonight, after seven months, more than seven months, the people in Gaza spent one night without any uh, sounds of uh, bombings and attacks and military attacks for the first time. They had a quiet night in seven months. You, see, uh, you talked about uh, the regime had to resort to this. Could you explain a bit more on why, what would the regime gain and what would Netanyahu gain by uh, basically uh, by a wider regional war? What would they gain from this? Well, uh, Mehdi, at this point in time, Netanyahu is finding himself in a very hot seat because uh, the goals and objectives that he claimed uh, he would achieve by uh, its military aggression on the people of Gaza, well, seven months, more than seven months have passed. Israel has definitely lost face in the international community. It is uh, very much isolated and uh, none of those military objectives so far have been achieved. Instead, we have seen a very resilient uh, people who are resisting against this uh, Israeli aggression. All of these atrocities, these war crimes, practically genocide that is uh, unfolding before our very eyes. And we see a very strong people who are still resisting. And this is definitely not something that the Israelis were expecting. Th uh, according to their plans and their objectives, they would have been able to achieve those probably in less than two weeks. Well, that obviously did not happen. And uh, we've also had reports uh, that uh, many people in uh, the occupied territories are um, demanding Netanyahu, they're holding him accountable for all of uh, the 
uh, attacks that have happened right now without uh, having uh, achieved any goals. And of course, the number of Israelis uh, that have been killed in these attacks, which is again another number that Netanyahu tries to hide, not providing the exact number of uh, soldiers that have been killed or uh, other um, Israelis that have been killed in the past seven months. So this is all something that puts Netanyahu in a very difficult position. Obviously, he would try to get himself out somehow, and at this point in time, coming out of Gaza uh, without admitting a very huge defeat would definitely be impossible for the Israelis, and uh, definitely Netanyahu would try to find a way to deviate attention uh, as it did tonight. Well, with what happened with this retaliatory IRGC attack, uh, he could not uh, attack Gaza anymore, but no one really paid attention to that, did they? Because all the media attention, particularly mainstream media, was now focused on condemning Iran for defending its obvious right. Now, do you think the, the Israeli regime have thought about the consequences of, in a way, you could say, poking Iran, uh, or they're just hoping, again, for the U.S. to come to their rescue? Well, it is a known fact that if the U.S., for even one single second, uh, stops its support of the Israeli regime, they would not last even a second. So uh, definitely it is the U.S. that has emboldened the Israeli regime for carrying out such actions. And let's not forget, of course, this is uh, related to Iran, and that is why we're focusing so much on that. But what's been happening over the past seven months is something completely unprecedented, something that un uh, in a civilized world, as uh, Western politicians like to uh, describe a world uh, in which uh, states abide by international law, etc., etc. Well, uh, this is something that is should not be happening, and it goes against all of those principles that they themselves have set up. So the Israeli regime has proven time and again that it does not uh, respect international law. It has a complete disregard for any kind of international convention whatsoever. And in this case, this is pretty much the same case as well. Thank you, Sue. Now, uh, I wanted to read the Iran, uh, the Iran Foreign Ministry statement again. Uh, the Armed Forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, in exercising Iran's inherent right to legitimate defense as stipulated in Article 51 of the United Nations Charter and in response to the repeated military aggressions of the Zionist regime and the martyrdom of Iran's official military advisors who were active in that country upon the invitation by the Syrian government, particularly the military attack on April 1 on our diplomatic locations in Damascus carried out a series of attacks against the military bases of this regime on April 14. Now, the Islamic Republic of Iran, while reiterating its commitment to the principles and objectives of the United Nations Charter and International Law, emphasizes its determination to decisively defend the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and national interests against any legal use of force and aggression. Uh, the recourse of the Islamic Republic of Iran to uh, defensive actions in exercising the right to legitimate defense is indicative of Iran's responsible approach towards regional and international peace and security at a time when illegal actions and genocide by the occupying apartheid Zionist regime against the Palestinian nation and the regime's repeated military aggressions against neighboring states and its warmongering in the region and beyond continue. Now, Gisu, uh, Gisu back to you. Uh, I want to see uh, about this statement. Some people say, um, in a way, Iran could have let it go. Could they? That is absolutely absurd because uh, what country would let go if they uh, attack, they literally attack and raise to the ground a milit uh, diplomatic mission? We went to Syria a few days ago with uh, the Iranian foreign minister to open the new consular 
section of uh, the Iranian embassy in Damascus. And we went to uh, the site that was attacked by uh, the Israeli regime. The building was completely razed to the ground by uh, that attack. What country, just name one country, that would accept that and would not consider it a red line? Because according to uh, the Vienna Convention, this is a clear declaration of war. That's right, Gisu. Uh, Iran also says that it will target any country that opens its airspace for an Israeli attack against Iran. Iran's defense minister, um, Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Ashtiani, issued a stark warning to any country uh, that allows Israel to utilize its airspace or territory for attacking Iran, saying they will face a decisive response from the Islamic Republic. Uh, I wanted you know. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, Gisu, which countries do you think might do this? Well, Iran is not messing around, Mehdi. This is quite obvious, and they have been very adamant in uh, showing that very clearly, that they are not uh, taking anything for granted anymore. And, of course, there were some uh, conflicting reports that Jordan might uh, open this airspace to Israel in order for them to uh, intercept uh, those um, uh, drones and missiles that are being fired towards Israel. But very quickly, we had Jordanian officials denying those reports and claiming that they're completely uh, uh, untrue. And, uh, of course, uh, it was also uh, a question whether the United States might or might not try to do anything in retaliation and in support, of course, of uh, the Israeli regime. The Iranian foreign ministry was quite clear in issuing a warning to the United States uh, and uh, letting them know that this will not go unanswered. Basically, uh, Iran has run out of patience. Gisu, thank you very much. It's 5 o'clock in the morning in Tehran. You can take a break. Now we will air a four-minute package uh, before we are joined by our new guests. So take a look. Nine Iranian missiles that Israel dreads. Number one, Sejil, a two-stage solid fuel surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missile. It has an operational range of over 2,000 kilometers. It's also one of the fastest missiles Iran has managed to manufacture domestically. Number two, the Khaybar or Khurramshahr 4. It was unveiled in May 2023. The new variant is reported to have a range of 2,000 kilometers and is capable of carrying a 1,500 kilogram warhead. It's equipped with an advanced engine that uses hypergolic fuel. It also has an airframe made of a composite material and mid-phase navigation system that enables it to correct its course when outside the atmosphere, so it is not reliant on terminal guidance that can be disrupted by electronic warfare systems. Outside atmosphere, the missile reaches a speeds up to Mach 16. Inside atmosphere, the missile will reach a speeds up to Mach 8. Number 3. Emod. It has a payload capacity of 750 kilograms. The Emod is Iran's first precision-guided, long-range surface-to-surface ballistic missile with a maneuverable re-entry that has an error rate of less than 10 meters. Number 4. Shahab 3. A medium-range liquid-fueled road-mobile ballistic missile with a range of up to 2,000 kilometers. It is primarily effective against large, soft targets like military airfields and can carry a one-ton warhead. Number 5. Qadr. It is a ballistic missile developed capable of carrying a warhead of a ton. It has a liquid fuel first stage and a solid fuel second stage, which allows it to have a range of up to 1,950 kilometers. Number 6. Pave. It's an Iranian long-range surface-to-surface cruise missile and has a range of 1,650 kilometers. Pave uses retractable wings on its body and the turbojet engine of this cruise missile is also outside the body and is located on its upper part. Pave has the ability to take different paths to reach the target. 
that is, before reaching the target, it circulates to the required extent and hits the target from another direction. Another capability of PAVE cruise missiles is the ability of these missiles to attack in mass and communicate with each other during the attack. In this method, one of the missiles acts as the leader of the attacking missile group and guides the other missiles. Number 7. Fatah 2 It's a hypersonic missile with glide capability. Only four countries in the world, the Islamic Republic of Iran included, have the technology to manufacture this type of hypersonic weapon. Fatah 2 is equipped with a hypersonic carrier that detaches from the missile itself and can perform rapid maneuvers to evade conventional missile defenses and move towards its target at hypersonic speed. Number 8. Khaybar Shikan. It has a definite operating radius of more than 1400 kilometers, while the maneuverability of this missile is very high compared to its classmates. It is also referred to as a long range ballistic missile. Another important feature of the Khaybar Shikan missile is its optimal design, which weighs up to one third less than similar models, and its preparation and firing time is reduced to one sixth. Number 9. The Hajj Qasem missile. It has a range of 1400 kilometers. This ballistic missile can carry a payload of 500 kilograms. Unveiled in August 2020, it is named after Iranian commander Lieutenant General Qasem Soleimani, who was assassinated by the U.S. in January 2020. It is capable of defeating missile defense systems because it can maneuver and hit targets without being detected. Well, thank you viewers for staying with us right here at Press TV as we continue with our rolling coverage of the unfolding, of course, situations taking place tonight. As we know, hundreds of uh, Iranian drones uh, uh, went towards the Zionist entity and um, along with missiles. And we have seen strikes that have taken place in various towns and cities inside of the Zionist entity reports we had. Uh, was that at least 50 percent of the missiles have gotten through the Iron Dome. Um, so it uh, seems to have been successful. We're still waiting for the overall results of what has been hit. We do know that a military base in Negev is one of the targets, and the IRGC had said that the targets were military in nature, but we're still waiting, of course, for all of the information to come in. We're going to cross over now to Vienna, joined by journalist and commentator Richard Medhurst. Richard, thanks for being with us. Your thoughts, tell me your thoughts tonight. It's great to see you, and thanks for having me on the program. Great to have My you. thoughts, I'm, I'm uh, stunned, I'm surprised, I'm taken aback. Uh, and uh, I think the Israelis are <laughs> feeling a lot more uh, surprised than, than, than we are. Uh, th this is the fact that it was not just Iran, but the entire resistance axis striking this colonial occupation, this illegal occupation, this illegal entity with, with such force. I mean, we've never seen anything like this in history. It is r truly remarkable and unprecedented. Uh, it, is, it is one of the most defiant acts of resistance in our lifetimes. And this day will be talked about for decades and decades to come. Uh, the Israelis and their so-called image of a military power, if it wasn't already already destroyed in 2006 or on October 7th, <laughs> I mean, it's certainly gone out the window today. Um, you just mentioned how half the missiles, more than half the missiles got through the Iron Dome. Uh, I'm, I'm certain it's a lot more than that. And uh, just before you were showing the, the various technologies that Iran has developed, I want to remind people that Iran did this under sanctions. So that, this is twice, thrice as difficult than other countries. And Iran not just developed these uh, defense programs under sanctions, but it exceeded and helped others in the region uh, to defend themselves. And that is truly remarkable and uh, something that has done us proud. Yes, indeed. Uh, you mentioned something I talked about in the very beginning, that we're talking about the, the Islamic Republic of Iran is the most sanctioned country up until, of course, uh, Russia uh, got that number one category um, after, of course, the Ukraine operation. But we're talking about more than four decades of pressure 
of, of not being able to get parts, not being able to get technology. Um, and uh, many times we have heard, actually, uh, various uh, leaders inside of Iran and, and saying that it is pressure, it is difficult, but it's through this pressure that has actually helped us to grow. And, and what we're seeing tonight, <clears throat> Richard, is something exceptional and probably few um, thought that it could happen. Let's talk about the significance in other ways. I mean, I was uh, monitoring uh, <clears throat> various uh, sites and um, the, the Palestinians tonight, we saw from Al-Quds, um, the mosque, uh, that people were gathering and celebrating. Uh, there was some video footage of uh, people from Gaza and saying it's the first time since October that there's nothing buzzing over their heads, that there is no noise. The drones have left, the planes have left. Um, and, and it's just so positive after all of this misery that we have been seeing and experiencing and so many of us yeah. feeling so helpless. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I was actually wondering earlier uh, how it will be in Gaza because at the end of the day, what is the resistance trying to accomplish? It's trying to lift the siege on Gaza and draw the Israeli forces away from Gaza to stretch them thin. Hezbollah have done a remarkable job of doing that, uh, pulling Israeli uh, occupation forces up north and then playing, uh, uh, you know, sending them on a wild goose chase, <laughs> which they've never recovered from. And, you know, that image of Al-Quds uh, and the Aqsa Mosque seeing the, the resistance rockets overhead, it, it's, it's such a powerful image. Uh, it's such a powerful image of resistance, of uh, freedom. I was very moved by it. I really couldn't believe my eyes. It, it, it has so much meaning. This is something that, in my opinion, uh, should be and will be printed on the front covers of history books. It is really, really something historical that we're living through. And, you know, the people in Gaza, they, they, um, their suffering is, is not in vain. Uh, they will be avenged. They will, be, they will be free, as will all Palestinians and Syrians and Lebanese and those living under the jackboot of the Israelis. Uh, you know, Iran has uh, everybody's backs. And even if they had done nothing today, the, the state of the Israelis is so bad already that it's only a question of time before they crumble. Look at Yemen, how they've crushed Israel's economy. Uh, look, look at uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, they've drawn Israel's forces thin. And look at the paranoia that uh, the Israelis had about, oh, will the Iranians hit us today? Will it be tomorrow? <laughs> this is very, very useful in wartime. Yes, indeed. And what um, else we've seen, especially tonight, coming um, from the West Bank, and I thought it was quite interesting that basically uh, they're saying they have revolted. We saw um, uh, just people coming out in mass and uh, showing their anger at the Israeli regime. How likely is it, uh, Richard, that this could actually uh, give the incentive, more of an incentive, of course they have all the incentives that's necessary, but uh, perhaps not feeling that they are alone. Um, and actually now the West Bank uh, individuals uh, being even more active than they have been. Of course, they have been under unbelievable attack also since October. Yeah, absolutely. And my, my uh, heart aches for them because it's often underreported. I mean, I, I know, of course, that, that, that you and I try our best to uh, shine light on this issue. But generally speaking, the people in the West Bank, they're not talked about and they're being hit. They're being killed. They're, they're being uh, bullied and harassed. Just yesterday, there's an Israeli uh, a pack of Israelis who rampaged. Uh, a Palestinian village, right. uh, 25 people wounded, one of them was killed. I mean, th this behavior is so sick, it's so emblematic of what Zionism is. And then these are the same people who are in the so-called army and then are, are given uh, machine guns. Uh, you know, the, the images that we're seeing tonight, they are empowering, they are galvanizing, they are images that, that give one um, hope and energy. And it's no wonder that we saw people in the West Bank uh, rising up, and I saw them also uh, dismantling part of, a, of, of an apartheid wall, and it uh, reminded me of when the Berlin Wall came down, and uh, inshallah, God willing, the same will happen with these uh, apartheid structures. Yes, yes, we, we hope and pray, Richard. Uh, you know, you're talking about being empowering, and I, it, it takes me back 
uh, to uh, the uh, beginning of the revolution in Iran and the words of Imam Khomeini and the importance of the Palestinian uh, situation to Imam Khomeini very early on in the revolution, as you know, uh, it, the first Palestinian embassy to open in the world was in Iran right after the revolution. And, and Iran has been steadfast in its support uh, for the Palestinians since that time until now, has paid a heavy price um, because of it. And it's interesting, though, Richard, there's so many people in this region, I'm talking about the Muslims and Christians of the region, that did not know to the extent that Iran has supported the, 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 the Palestinians all along. Of course, that's part of this whole controlling the narrative and trying to show yeah. as if Iran's a Shia country and uh, do not support Sunnis or Christians or whatever. Um, has, has that basically been broken, that their version of the narrative, has it been totally destroyed? Well, it, it's funny, uh, Marcy, because w one day they say that, um, uh, you know, uh, that uh, Iran has these Shia proxies, and then the next day they say that uh, Hamas is being supported by Iran. So right. which one right. is it? You know, and, and Venezuela, is Venezuela a Shia country? Uh, I, I think that uh, this image, uh, or rather this, this, this um, uh, uh, facade that they like to impose on Iran, um, this, it's really a, a disgusting colonial view because they, they see everything as sectarian, you know? Got to carve this, this land out, put Christians here. We've got to carve this one out, put Muslims here. This is the French, the British, the American colonial thinking. And, uh, you know, the world is waking up to this. Uh, you know, without Iran, uh, without Iran coming in and helping Syria, a lot of Christian communities w would have disappeared because of uh, the United States sending Al-Qaeda. And then these senators who are funding this turn around and pretend that they're, they're good Christian men. It's really nauseating. Uh, the, the ones that really support the minorities that are fought for everyone's rights, regardless their religion or ethnicity, it's Iran. And I asked the question earlier today, when is the last time that an Arab country did what Iran has done today? It's been a long, long, long time. And I, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, really, it really makes uh, uh, countries, uh, specifically the oil kingdoms, look bad because they have not suffered. Uh, they have chosen the easy way to normalize ties. And you were mentioning how Iran has suffered and paid a price. Absolutely. It's, it's one, the, the number one reason that they hate Iran is because Iran has always been steadfast with the Palestinians. Syria has summered, uh, suffered a similar fate, you know, because it's, it allows Palestinian Islamic Jihad to be in Damascus. It allows the weapons to flow through to Hezbollah. They hate Syria because of that. So in the end, they, they carry out violence, but they won't win. And tonight, this, this was proven. Right, you mentioned Syria. Let's talk about Syria a little bit, because uh, uh, we yes. know that once again, uh, the Israeli regime tonight attacked Syria. Your thoughts on that, and why do we see these continuous attacks on Syria? Well, it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, th this is... Uh, where I was born, I was born in Damascus, and uh, you know, seeing the Israelis vomit week in and week out, and uh, destroying the airport that I've been through a million times, it, it, it's it's upsetting. But I take, uh, uh, you know, I draw strength, and I and I uh, uh, remember that uh, the images we see tonight uh, prove they won't win in the end. The reason they keep bombing Syria, you know, they they're doing it because they think they can get away with it. Uh, there's the Mossad, the former Mossad director, who goes on Al Jazeera and he says the, the rules of the game are different. You know, he speaks about the war uh, as if it's a game. Um, and it really exposes so much about their attitude. You know, Syria has been um, a, a country that has supported the Palestinians and also taken in many refugees, you know, Armenian, Palestinian, Iraqi. Uh, it has always had its, uh, you know, uh, arms wide open to accept various communities. And what the West have done with their war on Syria, they have fractured a very precious social fabric where you've got a million different ethnic groups and religious groups living together like a nice uh, mosaic. Um, and this is an unforgivable crime. Uh, not to mention the, uh, the cities, the, the archeological sites that they have, um, uh, that they have uh, looted. The Israelis were caught 
trying to steal uh, a ancient Jewish artifact during the earthquake last year. Right. Uh, right. And uh, you know, it just it just shows you how they do whatever they can to bring a country to its knees. Um, but without Iran, without Russia, and they would have surely succeeded. But I know for a fact that just like the Palestinians will be free, so will Syria. The Israeli occupation is going to lose the Golan Heights. They will not win. And uh, right. this attitude of drone striking UN workers, uh, attacking civilians, they will pay a heavy price for this. And tonight is just the beginning. Yes, let's hope so. And uh, staying with Syria, though, uh, of course, uh, Iran, uh, part of the reasons for this retaliatory attack is that attack in Damascus on the Iranian right. uh, consular area of the embassy. Uh, and, and, and what happened after that, what Iran says, is the lack of condemnation of these countries, the Western hegemonic bloc, and, and also even the UN Security Council, that did not condemn an attack on uh, basically what is considered sovereign property or land of Iran. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree 100 percent with you, um, Marcien. You know, when I, when I look at this attitude, this callous uh, attitude of the uh, United Nations Security Council, it's it's disheartening. It's upsetting. And I watched that that uh, session. Uh, you know, I paid great attention to it to hear what uh, the representatives of Syria and Iran said, and they did nothing. And now Israel is playing the victim and demanding an emergency session uh, to do what? to admit it, its guilt, because this all started with the Israelis bombing the embassy. You know, the, this is such a brazen violation of the Vienna Convention. Article 22 says very clearly, you cannot touch diplomats, you cannot touch diplomatic premises. And the Israelis had the goal, they had the stones to go on uh, CNN. Uh, this is the Israeli army spokesperson. And he, he's, he didn't admit that they bombed it, but then he did say that it's not an embassy. Who said that it's his, uh, you know, who gave him the right to decide what is an embassy? The Syrian government decides that. And, uh, you know, it, it has accepted the credentials of Iran. Iran is an ally. So, you know, it's none of uh, the Israelis' business. And they, their propaganda is so vile. You know, they think that they can manipulate international law, manipulate public opinion. Uh, never in history have we seen such a brazen attack. The Americans bombed the Chinese embassy, but they at least apologized. I don't know if they meant it. But they at least, you know, had this facade. Right. Where is the apology? Where, where is the condemnation? If the world had actually done something about this bombing, about this attack, uh, you know, the Israelis wouldn't have been attacked tonight. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, as we're saying this, let me just read uh, the uh, Canadian Prime Minister now, Justin Trudeau, has said he unequivocally condemns Iran's attacks on Israel. He says that these attacks demonstrate yet again the Iranian regime's disregard for peace and stability in the region. We support Israel's right to defend itself and its people from these attacks. Your thoughts, Richard? I mean, I'm, I'm uh, sick of these statements, you know. It's just <laughs> hollow words. And I've read a bunch of them tonight. I read the one from Rishi Sunak. I read the one from Olaf Scholz. Um, I saw Mike Pompeo, this, this criminal, uh, uh, talking about Iran. I mean, they, where was their condemnation when Israel bombed the embassy? Can we please, you know, have an answer to this question? Where was the condemnation? You know, it, it, we've reached a point where Western uh, governments and politicians are so, so criminal that they don't even bother with the facade of pretending to care. You know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, they, they, they would have at least pretended to care. But now they are so consumed with their Zionism and their imperialism that, you know, it, the facade is, is not even an issue for them. Uh, you know, and this uh, acting like Israel is the victim. The, the Israelis, I have a very simple solution for them. If they don't like being attacked, they shouldn't go bombing embassies and stealing land from people. It's a very simple solution. Right. Uh, stay with me, Richard. We uh, reports now sirens are being heard. Again, the Occupy Golan Heights area. Again, more sirens are going off in the Occupy Golan Heights. And, and Richard, we saw earlier in the night that uh, Hezbollah launched uh, rockets towards the Occupy Golan Heights. And also we had reports of uh, Yemeni uh, drones uh, heading towards the uh, regime. Um, it, it, it seems to be multi-pronged as far as yeah. the attacks uh, from 
the resistance. Let's talk about the role of the resistance in general during this last six months. God bless them. God bless them because they're doing God's work. And uh, the fact that it was multi-pronged or a multi-front um, effort today and every day, actually, because, um, you know, Gaza, of course, gets all the attention and, and deservedly so. But, uh, you know, when we talk about the war in Gaza, we have two wars. There's the Israeli massacre, the genocide of civilians. And then there's the, the real battlefield where they fight man to man. And the Israelis uh, lose in that one because they... Uh, it's very easy to kill civilians, but when they when it comes to Hezbollah, uh, they're scared. Uh, even since 2006, uh, they're scared of the Yemenis. They're scared of everyone. They can't contend with real resistance soldiers. And Yemen, uh, you know, firing the drones. I mean, we should take a moment to appreciate and understand what that means. Uh, the technology, the precision, the uh, knowledge to fire, of, uh, you know, missiles that reach all the way in Eliat or Imm al-Rashash, or all the way in Haifa uh, from Iraq. I mean, this is, uh, this is stunning, you know, in a good, in a good way. Um, and this is all thanks to Iran. Iran developed the technology. Iran provided it to the resistance so that they can liberate their lands. Um, and, uh, you know, it's gotten better and better. Meanwhile, uh, the West has declined. Israel has declined. Uh, their international image is in the trash. Their economy is, is gone. Uh, they have no means to win militarily. And so now it's the time for the resistance to take over. And I have every confidence that they're going to win because it's multi-pronged, because everyone is doing their part. Right. Well, we've already seen um, within the last six months uh, more and more uh, Zionist settlers leaving the regime. And I'm sure there were a lot of that wanted to get out of their uh, the last couple of days, especially today. And, and I'm sure, Richard, we're going to see more of them leaving, as many have said. That's the difference between people who are from this land and has an investment yeah. in the land and those who have uh, come from elsewhere. What do you think? You think that we're going to be seeing uh, 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 more of an exodus by these settlers? Yes, and, and good riddance because th there's no love for colonizers. The whole world understood in 1945, colonialism is bad. Now, obviously we, we transitioned to neo-colonialism, but still, the Israelis are the only ones in 2024 still uh, advocating for settler colonialism. And I, I know that already in October, this is again from uh, Times of Israel, I believe, that uh, even back then you had hundreds of thousands of them leaving. Uh, if you might recall the first day on October 7, you saw the images of them rushing to Ben Gurion Airport. Right. Let, let me just say what a luxury that is. Palestinians cannot rush to an airport. They do not have a second passport to whip out and enter another country. And uh, you know th this is the difference. And and uh, uh, they they think that uh, it's their land. It's not their land. You know, every U Israeli prime minister um, was born in Eastern Europe, or their parents or grandparents uh, came from Eastern Europe. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with emigrating somewhere, but co colonialism, where you're stealing land, you're killing people, uh, there's everything wrong with that. And, uh, you know, the Palestinians only have Palestine. And these disgusting plans that they, they go on television and say, we want to put them in the Sinai Desert or distribute them around the world. If you talk like this about them, and again, it, it's not bad because they are colonizers. They, they can actually leave. They would be infuriated. They would be enraged. They would say it's anti-Semitism. So they're, they're double standard, and, and the way they speak about Palestinians like they're boxes in a garage or something that need to be moved. It's so, so revolting. And again, no love for, for colonizers. When the French left Algeria, hundreds of thousands of them were leaving uh, every month. And we're not at that pace yet, but I think that they're all going to leave. Because when it comes down to it, when you know this is not your land, you don't want to die for it. That's the difference. The Palestinians are ready to die for the land because it's their land and nobody else's. Right. And we have seen over the last six months unbelievable images of, of kids, young kids, and, and just uh, talking about Palestinian children. That is their land. <clears throat> they will stay there. They will not leave Gaza. Unbelievable courage, uh, samples of courage and uh, tenacity that we have seen from the Palestinians in general. Um, that people around the world have been so affected 
by what has happened the last six months, of course, the overall genocide, but also the reaction uh, by the Palestinian people and, and that dignity, Richard, um, that we see, um, the way that they express themselves, the way that they um, show their solidarity, and still, after all of this pressure, the way that they still are supporting the resistance. Yeah, it, it's really uh, so graceful and humbling uh, to hear how the Palestinians speak about their land, and especially the children, as you said. They have such uh, courage and bravery and uh, tenacity, and it's, it, it really, um, I, I've, I've read and, and heard that people all over the world um, you know, have, have begun to look at them as an example, as a role model, and think, you know, if they're going through that and they're toughing it out, then I can do this thing, because this is nothing in comparison. And so it's, it's, people are drawing strength from that. And uh, the admiration for the Palestinians only goes up. And these children, I just want to say something harrowing. 10,000 children in Gaza have lost their fathers. I mean, when we hear figures like this, you, you want to cry. And these children, when they grow up, they will, many of them will join the resistance. And I will never, ever condemn what they do. Because they, they are the, the, uh, the landowners. They are the keepers of that land. And it is their right to resist. I will never condemn what they do or what they become. Uh, because uh, it, it is insulting to do so. Yeah, indeed. And as a matter of fact, I mean, what the Israeli regime has done in the last six, six and a half months uh, is basically um, uh, they are even, there are even more individuals than before that are willing, ready, and able to join the resistance. Because it basically, Richard, what has happened, I think that uh, everyone has realized that there is no other choice. Even those before who believe in diplomacy or various yeah. uh, political efforts, thinking that there was a possibility. Uh, they have seen uh, from Camp David to uh, so many other uh, different agreements that nothing worked. But the Palestinians have been killed ever since the Nakba and even before. Um, by the settler colonialists, and it just continues. That what other choice is there? And I think that this has been the biggest recruiting uh, agent, if you want to say, for the resistance the last six months in kids and young people seeing the reality of what is happening. And and, and I think you know, Richard, we have to look at uh, the the type of destruction that that these individuals have witnessed the last six months. I mean, no electricity, very little water, very little food, and of course the constant bombing and attacks and the snipers, and then total destruction. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable that those of us watching it have been so affected and shed tears, yeah. but then we think about the people who have been going through it day to day. Yeah, it, it's uh, really harrowing, and and you know, as you said, we're only wa watching it, and and uh, we already feel disheartened. So we can only imagine how the Palestinians in Gaza feel. Uh, they, they are the bravest and and the best that that uh, humanity has to offer. And about diplomacy, I want to remind the viewers that there was a Swedish diplomat um, who his name was Count Bernadotte. And he tried to mediate a peace deal uh, between the Arabs and Britain in Palestine. And do you know what the uh, Zionists did? They executed him. They, they assassinated him while he was in a UN convoy. That's right. That is Israel's position towards diplomacy. They murder diplomats. And when you sign away your land, even when the Palestinians gave away half their land as part of the Oslo Accords, it's still not enough. They build more illegal settlements. They kill more Palestinians. Walid Daqqa, who died in prison last week, whose body they refused to release, was supposed to be out in 1993. So, you know, they always violate the agreements. You can't win with the Israelis. They will never, ever adhere to the accords and, and, and uh, agreements that they sign. It's all about them. They think they're superior. They think that they are better and they will kill people for, you know, they will do whatever it takes to steal this land. And so they leave one no choice. When you've tried diplomacy over and over again, and you get killed for that, you're, you see your friends and family murdered in front of you. Uh, what choice uh, does that leave but armed struggle? And again, we shouldn't talk about it like it's a bad thing, of course, because 
uh, the Israelis hate appointing it out, but armed struggle is illegal. It's enshrined in international law. And every human being who is living under military occupation has the right to fight that occupation. Yes, indeed, indeed. Of course, viewers, if you're just joining us, it has been a very, very busy night. It continues to be so. Over 200 uh, Iranian drones uh, launched against the Israeli regime that, uh, and also along with missiles uh, that have been sent. Reports that we were getting where at least 50 percent have gotten through. We have seen explosions taking place in various uh, towns and cities inside of the occupied territories. And, and, and Richard, what we've also seen are just signs of joy, um, celebrations, whether we're talking about um, inside of Gaza or Al-Aqsa, as I said earlier, in Iraq, in Lebanon, um, inside of Iran, uh, and I'm sure inside of Yemen. I haven't seen actually uh, any sure. uh, footage yet inside of Yemen, but we know our Yemeni brothers and sisters have definitely been there yes. every step of the way. Yeah, yeah, without w without a, a shadow of doubt. You know, the the Yemenis will have the biggest crowds of all. It's just a matter of time till we get the footage. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, you know, I I know for a fact that people are still outside now in the streets in Damascus and in, in Beirut. <laughs> Um, because it gives them hope. Uh, you know, again, we should remember that that uh, people are tired. You know, they they they've they've had resources stolen from them, um, their lives affected by by this occupation that never leaves the Americans, the Israelis. They they've reduced the quality of life for many people. I remember, for example, in Syria, um, you know, it, it, just before the war, brand new infrastructure being built, no more electricity cuts. It, it, the the country was getting so good. And then the West and Israel and their allies in the, in the region destroyed it all. Um, right. And uh, now they've set the country back. And they're doing the same to Lebanon with the de facto U.S. sanctions. They're doing the same to everyone. So when they see these images, it's, it's, it's like they're empowered. You know, this is their liberation. Uh, for once, the Israelis get a taste of their own medicine and not uh, the innocent civilians who just want to right. live in peace. Right, right. You know, you made an interesting point because, uh, you know, as an American and, and growing up and hearing about this part of the world, it's always, uh, it, it was always projected that those people, they, they always want war. They, they always are after conflict. And instead of uh, the beauty of this part of the world and the love between the people and families and the absolute joy for life as a matter of fact. But as you have said, when you, you gave an example of Syria, and, and we have so many others, of how the, the hegemonic front, especially the United States, has continually tried to destroy these countries, putting under economic pressure or military pressure um, I, I think about, for example, Iran and the sanctions, or Syria and the sanctions, or Lebanon after the bombing and the sanctions and the banks, and just continual pressure. But when it's shown to the outside world, I'm talking about basically um, to the West in general, it is shown as that these people are always troubled. They, they just, they don't want to live in peace. I mean, but I'm hoping that this time around Richard that scenario, scenario, that narrative has been broken. Because what, uh, what else we have seen during the last six, six and a half months, as Muslim men have always been demonized, we have seen these yeah. strong Muslim men and holding their babies and, and digging through dirt with their bare hands, trying to find yeah. their women, their sisters, their wives, and the love of family all of what had been uh, basically shown in a totally negative way, I think that this last six months have uh, at least shown the reality to those who want to see. Inshallah, God willing, because I, I find it horribly racist, um, and I'm sure you'd agree with me how they, they depict the Middle East, like as if, oh, well, you know, there are a bunch of savages who like to fight. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. They've, there's fighting because of the West because the West won't leave the region alone. They, they leave that part out. <laughs> and then they, they say, oh, well, it's about religion. Uh, no, 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 there's, you know, if Iraq, for example, um, or, or Syria, for example, before these wars and invasions, uh, no one cared if you're Sunni or you're Shia. This is not a thing, it doesn't come up. You know, it, you, you don't discriminate or, or 
uh, think badly or, or question what uh, faith your neighbor is, because the, the society, as you said, has a love of life. And, and they, they destroyed that. They, they brought so much death. I honestly look at this, uh, at the region, and I, I tell myself, this is evil, what they've done. Like, truly the, the devil himself is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as they say, America is the great Satan, and I can only agree. Um, but uh, again, you know, the resistance gives people hope. It gives me hope. Um, and Iran is a very patient country, has tried to do things diplomatically. Syria, the same thing. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, they, they think uh, kindness and patience is a form of weakness. And that's not how, you know, we, we, we live in this region, how we're taught. Um, it's a very, very different mentality. And, you know, the family relationship, uh, th there's a tighter social fabric uh, in the Middle East, in, in West Asia, in our region, that you don't find, unfortunately, in the West. And I think that's why a lot of people in the West, they have... Uh, uh, mental troubles and they struggle because the society has been made about uh, to to about individualism to to be more individualistic and selfish right. and we don't have that we don't have that right right and definitely uh, there is a difference uh, and you know I, I believe uh, Richard that uh, during this last again six months or so that a lot of Westerners, especially young people who have been exposed to this and have been so impressed actually by what they see. Uh, I remember even one of the uh, Israeli captives who was freed, it was a child, and then the right. sister of that child saying, well, we don't know what has happened to her because now whenever she wants to eat, she wants to share it first, like others to eat with her. Uh, or eat before her right. prior to she eating, and she wasn't like that before. I mean, just under being under the influence of the Palestinians for a short period of time had that much of an effect. And, and I, I do believe, and I'm in contact with a lot of people throughout the world, and a lot of Westerners, especially young people, are seeing through this, and 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 they think it's beautiful that the whole family yes. structure, the whole. Um, basically, uh, that lack of individualism and the we factor is actually quite appealing to these societies that have reached a dead end, that uh, it's just so out yeah. of order, we don't even know what is a female and what is a male anymore, so there's just <laughs> total confusion. Yeah. So this is so beautiful for a lot of these Westerners, and it, it has been so appealing. Yeah, it, it's... it's um... You know, it's it's really enriching, and uh, I think that uh, it, it's just a hu it's human nature to to draw satisfaction out of being kind to others. And this thing you mentioned, it's such a small thing to offer uh, those around you the food before you eat yourself. Um, you know, it, it's it's such a small thing, but it makes such a big difference. And uh, these customs, you know, they they're normal in 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 West Asia, in Iran, in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in our parts of the world. But then in in the West. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't have that, and I think it's a shame. And I'm really uh, hoping that young people are seeing through that uh, through, on multiple levels. I hope that they become kinder, that they prioritize family over individualism. I hope that they see through the racism, that they understand that, you know, we're all equal, uh, and the fighting in the Middle East is not uh, the fault of the people in the Middle East. And I hope they learn what imperialism and Zionism are, so that mm. these things are exposed and finally rejected by the mass of people. Right, right. Well, I think it started, you know, it, with the uh, various journalists uh, during the the whole um, Russian operation of Ukraine, and we remember seeing it. But, yeah. but, but they're just like us. They're they're just like us. This is not Baghdad. This is not Damascus. Um, the absolute racism um, yeah. that existed, and even recently with the uh, humanitarian workers that were foreign, who were targeted by the Israeli regime. Exactly. Uh, we saw this type of outrage for those seven individuals, and of course, each and every Nothing life is us. precious, um, but we're talking about more than 30,000 Palestinians who had been killed. And, and the reaction, though, was so different, even with those, those seven. Yeah, I mean, just you have the right color passport, and suddenly your life matters more. <laughs> it's like it's the most childish thing I've ever heard. Right. Um, it, it really, so so racist and discriminatory that they matter more because one of them is an American and one is one of them is British. 
they're, they're civilians and, and guess what? In Gaza, there are many others just like them who've done more work than them or just as much work as them. And, and they had just as much bravery and they were killed and you didn't care. So, you know, I, I think honestly, they, they, they talked about the world central kitchen um, in part because it, they're racist. Uh, and I'm, I mean the Western leaders. But I think the main reason that they talked about it is because the Iranian embassy was bombed the day before. Mm -hmm. And this is such an outrageous crime on, when you look at it on an international scale. They wanted to avoid talking about it. So they used the world central kitchen to, to distract people. I think right. I really believe that this is uh, their motives. Right. And you, you mentioned uh, also these statements that uh, people make on social media or whatever, you know, like, oh, this is, this is uh, not Baghdad or, or, for example, when there was a uh, barbed wire set up around the capital, this is after January 6th, they said, oh, it looks like Baghdad. And I mean, I find this so insulting because mm -hmm. these jeeps and military vehicles in, in Iraq were brought by the Americans. It, Baghdad doesn't That's look right. like that. This That's is right. Baghdad un under occupation that looks like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in the irony of it, can I just say, Richard, again, as an American, and I know um, that uh, sometimes walking in the streets of the U.S. and and, and the type of uh, uh, weaponry that you will see or the type of the way the yeah. police <laughs> react over there, it's really, really amazing that that is shown as just the, you know, the symbol of freedom and lack of oppression. I want to read something, uh, Richard, from the Iranian U.N. mission. It's a letter to the president of the UN Security Council um, and uh, saying basically, uh, I would like to inform you that in the late hours of the April 13th, 2024, the Islamic Republic of Iran carried out a series of military strikes on Israeli military objectives. This action was in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense as outlined right. in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations and in response to the Israeli recurring military aggressions, particularly its armed attack on the 1st of April 2024 against Iranian diplomatic premises in defiance of Article 2 of the Charter of the United Nations. Regrettably, the UNSC has failed in its duty to maintain international peace and security, allowing the Israeli regime to transgress red lines and violate the fundamental principles of international law. Such violations have exacerbated tensions in the region and threaten regional and international peace and security. As a responsible member of the UN, the Islamic Republic of Iran is committed to the purposes and principles enshrined in the Charter of the UN and international law and reiterates its consistent position that it does not seek escalation or conflict in the region while warning about any further military provocations by the Israeli regime. The Islamic Republic of Iran reaffirms its unwavering determination to defend its people, national security and interests, sovereignty and territorial integrity against any threat or acts of aggression and to respond to any such threat or aggression vigorously and in accordance with international law. Iran will not hesitate to exercise its inherent right of self-defense when required should the Israeli regime commit any military aggression again, Iran's response will assuredly and decisively be stronger and more resolute. I should be grateful if you would circulate the present letter as a document of the Security Council. Your thoughts uh, about this letter? It's, it's uh, very eloquently written and straight to the point. And Article 51 in the UN Charter, it, it, it enshrines the right to self-defense of states. And, and just to show you some hypocrisy, the Americans, the, the US government, when they murdered uh, Qasem Soleimani, they then submitted a letter to the UN Security Council citing Article 51, that they were defending themselves by murdering. Uh, again, we should, we should remember that Soleimani was uh, invited on an official visit, a diplomatic visit. So they also killed diplomatic uh, personnel then. I mean, to, to use Article 51 to justify a murder of uh, someone like General Soleimani is so, uh, uh, you know, vile to me. And um, the fact that when, you know, a country like Iran is actually legitimately using Article 51, they just ignore it and they act like, you know, it's, it's aggression. The world is upside down. It's really upside down. It's so difficult to, uh, trying to reason with these uh, 
Western countries. And uh, again, I, I'm I'm also ashamed of my government, you know, because the UK is just as bad as as the US in this regard. Um, and uh, they will run to say Israel has the right to defend itself. What about Iran's right to defend itself? Th this is a bombing of an embassy. If someone bombed the U.S. embassy, would they not do? The, would they not respond in kind? If someone bombed an Israeli embassy, would they not respond in kind? Yes, indeed, indeed. Well, stay with me, Richard. Let me cross over to San Bernardino, California, and welcome David Yacoubian, professor of history, California State University, San Bernardino. David, thanks so much for being with me. Um, well, we've been covering now for hours, rolling coverage and dealing with Iran's retaliatory attacks. I'd like to start off from here, your perspective of uh, what's taking place as we speak. Thank you, Marzi. And if I might just give a little bit of broader historical perspective, as I was listening to uh, some of your commentators earlier uh, sure. in your conversation and your very excellent questions, um, I was uh, uh, reminiscing about the title of Nikki Keddy's book about Saeed Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, who was an, an advocate of pan-Islamic unity in the late 19th century. And the title of her book is An Islamic Response to Imperialism. And as you were discussing uh, uh, with your <laughs> guests, the fact that uh, right now, the resistance against Zionism uh, transcends linguistic divisions within the region and certainly sectarian divisions within the region. Um, it, I, I do believe that uh, Saeed Jamal al-Din al-Afghani would be very proud to see um, what is clearly an Islamic response to imperialism, uh, which uh, has been taking place, uh, well, certainly uh, very vociferously uh, uh, led by the Palestinians since October 7th, but certainly also now including Ansarallah, Hezbollah, um, and most importantly, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Yes, yes. And so just overall, I mean, what has happened uh, tonight, uh, uh, even the Israeli regime itself admitted that the attacks were larger than expected. Um, your thoughts about that, David? Uh, was this uh, miscalculated? Um, that the Israeli entity uh, does it not know um, the capability of Iran, or, or how do you see it? Well, uh, it, it's hard to get into the mind of, of uh, Zionists and, and imperialists because uh, what they deem to be appropriate or proportional or legal within uh, what we all know they refer to as the, the rules-based international order, which is essentially the rules that they make up for themselves and to promote their own hegemony. So I don't really know what the Zionists uh, considered would be an appropriate response, but certainly the Islamic Republic of Iran wouldn't respond by uh, hitting a diplomatic mission, considering the fact that uh, this is a gross violation of international law. So I, and I believe many other observers who I, I've been uh, listening to and reading Meeting over the last few weeks, uh, we're certain that uh, Iran was was going to strike uh, relevant military sites, uh, and so um, the the exact number, uh, the the exact uh, proportion of you know drones to ballistic missiles or the methods, of course, that's totally up to the IRGC. But I believe the Zionists made a, a very very dramatically. A uh, uh, poor decision to test the resolve of the Islamic Republic of Iran continually, um, especially in light of the previous six months of genocide being unleashed uh, on the Palestinian people in Gaza. Once the Zionists crossed the line um, and attacked sovereign territory of the Islamic Republic of Iran in Damascus, uh, whatever they thought might have been the response uh, it, it is essentially too late for that. And, and I will just add that. Uh, for the United States and or uh, the British or any other European government to complain about Iran's response, uh, what happened in the United Nations was despicable. And this is that uh, there was not a Security Council resolution condemning what is an obvious violation of international law. Uh, so uh, this is, is, in my view, largely their responsibility and particularly the responsibility of the United States of America, who the world has watched uh, promote, sustain, fund and give diplomatic cover to, as well as the, the kinetic material for the ongoing genocide in Gaza. Yes, indeed. And, you know, we've, uh, as we've been talking, uh, that at least if the uh, Western hegemonic front had condemned the Israeli 
uh, attack on the uh, Iranian embassy. Perhaps what we're seeing tonight would have been avoided to a certain degree. Um, but the U.S., U.K., and France have reports that they refuse to allow the U.N. Security Council to condemn the regime's airstrikes. So, David, staying with you, I mean, that brings us back to the, the lack of effectiveness of the U.N. Security Council, of the United Nations, which we have seen throughout this Israeli genocide. Do you think that, that we are on the, uh, uh, in this transition mode that basically a new world order is in the process of being set up, an alternative to what we have been seeing since the end of World War II. Well, I, I do believe indeed that we are watching the, the unfolding of a new world order, a, a return to multipolarity. Um, I don't think that this is what Condoleezza Rice was talking about when she spoke about the birth pangs of a new Middle East, but I do uh, believe that this is, is uh, not only where we are headed, we, we are seeing this unfold right now, but, but related to your excellent question about the United Nations Security Council, um, the, it, it, the, the problematics of the Security Council have been essentially built in since World War II, and, and it is the, the P5, the permanent five members of the Security Council, and their veto power over the rest of the world that makes the institution of the United Nations essentially ineffectual uh, when it is most critically needed uh, to exercise uh, uh, power. Uh, it, 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 is, it is unable to because of, of this, this built-in feature. Uh, therefore, with the, the ongoing march towards multipolarity and the uh, the creation of new organizations as well as new institutions, um, I believe that it will be possible, if not, and I don't think that it would necessarily be effective to create an alternative mechanism because the, the, the one benefit of the United Nations is that it does uh, include the nations of the world, but uh, potentially pressure uh, to be able to be exerted uh, within the United Nations and potentially to reform this very problematic United Nations structure by larger blocks of an increasingly uh, uh, multipolar world in which uh, various poles can can uh, exercise hegemony and point out uh, the the, the uh, proper facets of international law, um, as opposed to just relying on and, if you will, waiting for uh, the P5, including the French, to decide what the rest of the world community should do, especially in the face of genocide that we have been watching on a daily basis for over six months now. All right. Richard, do I still have you with me? Of course. Okay. Well, Richard, I, I want to look at, uh, uh, we, we know what happened with uh, Lieutenant General um, uh, Ghassan Soleimani when, when he was assassinated. Um, and of course, he uh, contributed so much to what we're even seeing take place today. And, and now we had uh, martyr, or General Martyr Zahedi, um, who of course uh, uh, was assassinated in Damascus at the consular section. Let's talk about how perhaps his martyrdom is opening up a whole new phase in this, uh, this war against the Zionist entity. Well, you know, the, the reason that the Israelis are targeting these, these men is because they do their jobs or did their jobs very, very well. And they were martyred while they were uh, fighting uh, the Israeli occupation. And the, the failure that the Israelis um, have uh, set, set themselves up for is that they don't grasp how the resistance works. You see, uh, you cannot just defeat it by killing one man because everybody in the region is suffering from the occupation. Everybody wants to get rid of it. So even if you, you martyr uh, you know, Qasem Soleimani, there are many others who, who are not exactly like him, but who have the same drive to continue this important work. And so, you know, in the West, it's completely different. You'll have one good leader and a party that is completely different or, you know, uh, incompetent and, and nothing like him. So they, they think that they can just kill uh, and assassinate people and then that will, you know, fix their problems. And now I must add that this comes from a culture of terrorism. We, we shouldn't forget the, the Israeli occupation forces were made up originally of a bunch of groups. Uh, like the Haganah, like the Lehi, Stern Gang, um, Irgun. Even Britain recognized these people as terrorists. And, the, you know, many there were two Israeli, Israeli prime ministers who could never go to Britain because they were wanted terrorists, uh, Begin and uh, Shamir. So 
that shows you um, that the Israelis never changed this culture of, of murder, of assassination. Uh, it's always remained to this day uh, from over 100 years ago. And that's why they, they, they go and kill people, even in an embassy, even when they're on a diplomatic visit. But they won't win because the resistance functions in a way that guarantees its victory. And it's simply because of the drive to get rid of the occupier. Yes, indeed, indeed, there's quite a drive. And I mean, after the martyrdom of uh, General Qasem Soleimani, I mean, we saw so many, even young kids, and saying that I am Qasem Soleimani. And, and after the martyrdom of uh, General Zahedi, uh, actually the leader of the revolution, Ayatollah Khamenei, had a meeting with the university students recently, and so many of them were saying, send us, send us, we want to go. Uh, and, and fight the, the Zionist entity. And I think that this is where the miscalculation lies, Richard, with that lack of understanding from these Western countries, these individualistic, centered type of, of countries, not understanding that, that uh, belief in sacrifice for a greater cause, um, that, for example, even the, the feeling that people have in dealing with the situation in Palestine, that it hurts, it's, it's part of us. You know, we are responsible, we have to do what we can do. I think that there's a grave miscalculation by these Western entities, because they cannot understand this type of mentality. How do you see it? I, I couldn't have said it better myself, honestly. Um, you, you, you really hit the, the, the nail on the head, and in this individualistic uh, society uh, that we have in the West, it, it's just inc incomprehensible uh, that uh, someone would, would sacrifice themselves for a cause. You know, uh, many, many people uh, are impassioned about what's happening in, in Palestine and all across the Middle East, and they've had enough, and they, they really, truly believe in this cause. The Israelis, as we were saying earlier, you know, they have the second passport, they can go to Ben Gurion and fly away. Uh, that's, not the, that's not a choice. That's not um, uh, a logical uh, thought process that someone in the Middle East has. There's, an, there's appreciation uh, and understanding for the worth of the land, the, of, of sacrifice, of martyrdom. The, these concepts maybe existed for a short while in the West, but they've been maintained in Middle Eastern and Muslim culture because they have a very, very special meaning. You know, there's nothing more, uh, um, there's nothing more valuable or, or respectable than somebody giving their life and, and being martyred for a cause uh, like the Palestinian cause. Uh, you know, m many children have lost their parents. Many parents have lost their children. It, it, the suffering is so it is so big. It's magnitudes, um, uh, you know, orders of magnitude that we have to do something about it. Whether it's it's working in journalism, exposing the Israelis or uh, the others who go and fight. Uh, we all have to do something about it. And, you know, it's, it's funny because in Europe, if this was the French resistance, they would romanticize it and it's great. But mm -hmm. they can't understand that today in our world, in 2024, the most respectable and effective resistance in the world is the axis of resistance. Whether you're talking about Hezbollah or the IRGC or the Hashd al-Shaabi or the Yemenis, they are the most effective and they are fighting for the most important cause. Right, right. Uh, well, stay with me, Richard. David, um, when looking at uh, the overall situation, uh, for example, uh, again, going back to the uh, beginning or the, after the victory of the revolution in Iran, and, and Imam Khomeini and saying that basically we're creating a new way. We're not going to be dependent on the East. We're not going to be dependent on the West but we're creating our own way, an, an independent way. And of course, from the very beginning, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union at that time uh, felt very threatened by this mentality. But I want to look at from where it started and, and now from where it has, uh, it has reached, because really it was the foundation of that perspective that we we're able to witness what we're seeing tonight. Your thoughts? Indeed, uh, and uh, you know, neither East nor West, but Islam. As uh, Richard was just eloquently responding to your excellent question just now, uh, I was I was reminiscing about the last will and testament of Imam Khomeini, in which mm -hmm. he expounds on the the, the central differences uh, between Islamic uh, and Islamic Iranian 
culture and that uh, of the the capitalist consumer West uh, and and the as you you mentioned uh, the the uh, and not that of course we can overgeneralize about about everyone in the West but the the tendency towards and focus on individualism rather than uh, the the collective and the, the the entirety of the society which which unfortunately you know Americans are are learning every day the hard way uh, just how little uh, uh, cultural glue uh, we have as a nation and how little the elites care about us. So there's absolutely none of this uh, collective spirit and vision. And so uh, Imam Khomeini uh, uh, very uh, uh, ardently and, and eloquently uh, admonished, if you will, uh, uh, people going forward to always keep in mind, no matter what sort of smoke and mirrors might be put up, uh, by the West uh, and and by the detractors of Islam and Islamic unity to stay steadfast in uh, the cultural uh, and religious traditions that uh, enable the the uh, entirety of the collective to move forward together and and I would I would e even uh, uh, argue that 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 uh, Islamic spirit um, and and that that. Uh, uh, a sense of unity, Tawheed, is something that also uh, can and beautifully does apply uh, to the rest of the world. Um, and so uh, Khomeini uh, nailed it. Uh, what, we have, what we have seen uh, over the last uh, 40 plus years um, is really the reification of his vision. Uh, and thankfully, and this also relates to uh, one of your questions and, and Richard's response, there is no shortage of uh, individuals within the collective who will carry Imam Khomeini's banner forward uh, to uh, uh, see the creation of the true justice that we all know can be brought about uh, and, and that must necessarily be brought about to supplant this bogus uh, rules-based international order uh, that, that is showing its true face today. Yes, indeed. And, and I mean, um, David, uh I, I just go back uh, again and, and thinking about the initial years, the, the beginning years after the uh, revolution, and I think it, uh, most people could not have even imagined the strength of the Islamic Republic at this point in time. And can I say the weakness of the hegemonic front? I mean, at, at that time, of course, the United States was still at the peak of its strength, and then, of course, we also had the uh, former Soviet Union, um, but it, the the depth one can say now of uh, Imam Khomeini's analysis, his political political uh, strategy in in dealing with the situation in this region and the world is is quite unbelievable. I mean, now we're fast forwarding. Um, he has even been dead more than 40 years or 30 years now. And, and now we're seeing the results of what he was saying. A lot of people could not have understood uh, when he was saying, for example, back then, that the Israeli regime is a cancer. It's like a tumor. It's going to spread. Um, it has to be stopped. And we see not only <clears throat> inside of the occupied uh, territories, but we see what it's doing to its neighboring countries, whether we're talking about Syria or Lebanon, and, and what it has done throughout the region and beyond. Your thoughts? I, I definitely uh, think that the, the uh, attempt by and epic failure of the hegemonic bloc to attempt to uh, overthrow or to destroy the the budding Islamic Republic of Iran is one of the the primary factors that has led to the strength of the Islamic Republic today in 2024. And this has been consistent. And you would think that they would start paying attention and taking notes or learning the lesson. Anytime the hegemonic bloc has attempted to counter or to stifle or to oppose the Islamic Republic of Iran or to think that they're so smart that they can politically and socially engineer politics and society and religion in surrounding countries to oppose the Islamic Republic of Iran, they have failed in an epic manner that has been counterproductive to their own agenda and their own interests. Uh, so 
uh, it is really truly remarkable. And this is definitely not lost on uh, observers of American foreign policy and even those who are supportive of the actions of the hegemonic bloc. Um, you know, they, they kick rocks as they uh, time and time again have to explain that this or that action of the United States of America is uh, what we uh, can look to to explain this or that development in terms of the strength of the Islamic Republic of Iran, both domestically, uh, economically, industrially, and also by way of its alliances within the region. So uh, again, you would think that they would quit while they're now falling behind, uh, but I I'm not going to hold my breath. Well, I mean, do you <clears throat> attribute that to just the the, the mere arrogance uh, uh, of them, uh, of it all? Um, because it is as if that it cannot or it does not want to change its uh, modus operandi in dealing with the Islamic Republic of Iran, cannot accept Iran, for example, as an equal or as a, a major player in the world, um, and, and will try to do its best uh, still to overthrow this revolution. I mean, we saw the, the hybrid uh, war basically last year, and, and they really thought they had it this time around, as they had thought so many times before, that they will not give up in trying to bring down the Islamic revolution. And yet tonight, we're witnessing attacks by the Islamic uh, uh, Republic of Iran on its number one ally, the Zionist regime in the region. Indeed, it is extreme arrogance and hubris that is unfortunately betrayed by uh, the, uh, a cancer uh, within uh, the, the uh, American social fabric, and that is a sense of American exceptionalism, that somehow, uh, irrespective of even the, the, the laws of nature and, and mathematics and physics, that the United States of America can somehow find the way to do whatever it wants to do at any time that it wants to do it, uh, irrespective of the, the, uh, the, the, again, the physical reality behind it, uh, the geographical reality, the economic reality. Uh, the United States is, is cursed by this sense of American exceptionalism. You join that together in this toxic brew with what I would call a, a murder-suicide cult. You put the United States of America together with the Zionists, and we have basically a murder-suicide of humanity uh, by way of full spectrum dominance, by, by way of global hegemony, um, or potentially uh, to, to uh, just destroy broadly. Um, and one might even uh, interpret that as to their own destruction, that they simply believe that they are so exceptional that uh, it's just not worth it. If the United States of America and the Zionists can't run the show, then what sort of a world would it be? Thankfully, this disease of American exceptionalism and that of the Zionist American murder-suicide cult is only relegated to uh, the continental U.S. Uh, as well as the Zionist entity. There, there are a few uh, affected by the disease in Europe as well. I'm not too sure if that's because they actually uh, caught it by contagion or if it's compromat uh, that, that has, has led them to take this position. But uh, extreme hubris, arrogance, and uh, American exceptionalism is really the only way that, that observers and analysts can explain this. And I spend a lot of time listening to observers of, of foreign policy and international relations these days. I mean, more than I would like to admit. And this is a question that is it comes up all the time. How can we explain this in the face of reality? Um, and, and again, in the face of geographical realities, technical, industrial, military, economic realities, how can and, you know, legal realities. How can the United States and Israel still be doing what they are doing? And time and time again, the subject returns to American exceptionalism, the curse of American exceptionalism, the position that the United States emerged in after the Second World War, and this belief on behalf of American uh, political elites and much of the population that therefore every enemy is Hitler, every war is World War II, every moment is a Munich moment, and uh, every enemy can potentially be made the Germans and the Japanese if they're bombed enough. Um, this is, is insanity, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I guess insanity probably best typifies uh, what U.S. foreign policy uh, and, and Zionism represent. Right, right, indeed. Unfortunately, I, I mean, I just feel, the, David, that <clears throat> we're looking at such a historic 
event right now, such an historic time. Uh, I am sure that uh, what we're witnessing tonight in this part of the world uh, will be written in history books. And I think like if we go back even from 7th of October until now, um, all of it is extremely historic. I mean, whether we're talking about the genocidal part and the tragedy, but also the other side, and especially tonight with what the Islamic Republic of Iran is doing. This, indeed, I, it's, it's uh, I, I guess I, I, I'm almost at a loss for words, but I'll just say this. I, I'm currently teaching a course on the Arab-Israeli conflict. It is 15 weeks, and uh, the, the uh, post- uh, October 7th period will be relegated to week 15. With that said, in teaching this history now over the last several months, as all of this was going on, it, it if you will, undergirds my, my belief and understanding that we are truly witnessing the last chapter of Zionism. And I, and I will just add on that note that it was long before, in fact, over a year before October 7th, when uh, former Prime Minister Ehud Barak of, of uh, Israel uh, came out with the statement that uh, he did not believe that Israel was going to make it to its 80th birthday. This mm -hmm. having to do with the pre already existing dynamics within the uh, apartheid state of Israel, having to do with its own internal dysfunction and its own internal contradictions. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is uh, the end of Zionism was coming, but everything that has happened since October 7th has radically accelerated that process, uh, including the, the extremely uh, historic events of today. Right, definitely. It has ex expedited its own end. And I mean, David, it, one has to think, I mean, when we look at the issues that take place in this region, um, without the, um, the existence of the Zionist entity, let's talk about West Asia and what it could look like. I, I was reminiscing about this with a colleague just a few hours ago. Uh, the, the think about the ability to have connectivity between Baghdad and, and Damascus um, and a free Jaffa, uh, a free Jerusalem. Uh, the the uh, productive capacity of the region, the, the capacity for trade, for exchange, for tourism, the, the sky is the limit. It's, it's, it's a shame because in, in having this discussion with my colleague, it, it was, it was, I was struck by the fact that this is perceived, I was perceiving this almost, it's like a fantasy because uh, of the, the last 40 years of my focus on the, the uh, rogue activities and scofflaw activities of the United States of America um, and its Zionist proxy. And so it, it, it's truly a momentous occasion as well today when we can envision a world and a region without Zionism. Um, and of course, I want to say, uh, this does not mean a world or a region um, without uh, Jews, without Christians, without uh, uh, Muslims of, of all different denominations right. of people, people of faith. Uh, th what this means is a region without Zionist apartheid. This means a region uh, without essentially a an American proxy to maintain tension, to maintain fear, to maintain conflict, to maintain arms sales, to maintain uh, uh, borders and, and forces at odds, to maintain tension, to promote sectarianism. Uh, the end of Zionism in the region truly holds out the hope of enabling peace and exchange and productivity and, and truly a, a positive and beautiful future for the region. I know that that's not hyperbole. Um, that is simply the, the possibilities of the region absent uh, the, the Zionist entity and what it has consistently promoted, which is hatred, which is division, uh, which is war, which is conflict, and which is fear. Oh, that, that was beautiful, David. It sounds just absolutely wonderful. And, and we see and we know the potential of the region. Uh, you were talking about, of course, that does not mean uh, this region without Jews. It does not mean this region without other minorities, Christians, or other uh, various uh, Islamic sects. And I think that that's what's important uh, to understand when we're talking about the end of Zionism. Uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with the end of Judaism. And uh, I remember talking to a, a rabbi 
once who was from Quds, <clears throat> an older rabbi who had said that actually he, he was born in Quds and he had very good relations, his family had very good relations with Muslims who were living right next door. And prior to the Zionist entity, Muslims and Christians and Jews lived side by side and in peace. I think this is very important. That must be reiterated and uh, is not talked about enough. And also the fact that the Christian Zionists in the United States, it's very interesting, their support for that regime is actually uh, against their own fellow Christians who are suffering from Zionism like the rest of the uh, people, the natives of uh, Palestine. Thanks so much uh, for staying with me, David Yankobian, Professor of History, California State University, San Bernardino. Um, I have uh, another guest coming up. Let me see, out of Karachi. Said Muaz Shah, Executive Director, Center for Islamic Law and Human Rights. Thank you so much for being with me, Said Muaz. Your take on what is taking place as we speak. Um, uh, thank you so much for having me on and uh, being here and sharing my views here from Pakistan. Thank you for being I've been up all night uh, watching the updates, and clearly this was something that was uh, definitely in the pipeline. It was expected, um, as we know that the attack, uh, the unjustified and the violation of international law, the Israeli strike on the uh, diplomatic mission in Syria, um, that was uh, something that is a international red line universally known. Um, it's another thing to hit military targets, or hypothetically, or even proxies, but to hit a diplomatic mission, this was a new low uh, for Israel to cross, and particularly during the sensitive time of what's going on in Gaza. Um, and of course, I think it was a desperate move by Netanyahu politically, as we know, he's been under pressure, even from the United States. But what was the really unfortunate uh, part about this was, was Iran did what exactly international law dictates, led the complaint to the United Nations, wrote to the Security Council and the Secretary General that this is a violation of the Vienna Convention. This is a violation of any basic international norm that even predates the United Nations to attack diplomatic or ambassadorial um, uh, places, uh, which as everybody knows that this is the basic standards of international communication between countries and it needs to be protected at all times. Um, and clearly this violation, what was the reaction? The United States not only uh, failed to condemn, very interestingly in their opening remarks, they said uh, as, as a thing to kind of um, qualify their statement, they said we were not aware of this action that Israel did by itself and we were involved. So first they extracted themselves from involvement and then they, they had no aim to it. Uh, very interestingly, as we the news has been coming out, Iran has been very open in communication about what's going to happen, what has happened. Okay, we're having some technical difficulty there, as of course we have been uh, going live for hours now. And for those of you who may just be waking up in different parts of the world, uh, let me just uh, bring you up to par a little bit with what has been going on for uh, about uh, seven hours now. We know that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, in retaliatory attacks, uh, uh, launched at least 200 drones uh, towards the Israeli regime. We do know that uh, uh, drones, some of the drones uh, reached their targets. We also know that Missiles were launched, not sure exactly the various types of missiles or how many yet, um, but we do know that uh, we're getting reports of at least 50% of them hitting their targets and hitting their targets exactly. And of course, uh, this is uh, with the uh, Israeli Iron Dome uh, that was in place. We know that the military base has been hit and that the IRGC has said that the targets are of military nature um, for now dealing with these retaliatory attacks for uh, the Israeli attack on the Iranian consular in, the, in Damascus uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think I still have you, Said Moaz. Can you hear me? I want to make sure your audio is good. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes, I, yes. I'm okay. Here. Yeah, I was sorry to interrupt you, but I uh, but I lost your your voice. I, uh, you know, you were talking about as far as the various attempts uh, that Iran had made and and even going to the United Nations and basically these Western countries not even condemning the Israeli terrorist attack on the Iranian consular section. Let's talk about that. And, and do you think that more and more the backing of this regime by this Western hegemonic front has proven that any country must have strength, must have military strength, along with the political strength, in order to make sure that they carry out um, their perspective and also to, to protect themselves. Because if we see the diplomatic efforts or political efforts without military strength, it seems like it does not mean a whole lot in this world um, that has become basically the one with the most strength rules. I mean, your thoughts on this? You're absolutely right, and that's a sad reality that we're facing today. And in mainly, this is the fault of the United States, uh, which actually, you know, in the beginning had actually founded and one was one of the chiefs of the creation of the United Nations after World War II, uh, because of their continuous uh, hegemonic uh, policies, as we've seen in Syria, in Libya, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Um, and this is just a, a conclusion. Um, you know, uh, as we heard Vladimir Putin and the Russian foreign minister time and again give reference to the situation in Ukraine, juxtaposing it with what happened in Iraq. And it's the same thing, calling a spade a spade. And that was something that unfortunately the international community was not able to do due to U.S. pressure. And I'll be very honest with you, Iran is actually not e only defending itself it actually in this moment is defending international order or what little of it we have remaining. Let me say that again. Iran is actually defending what little bit of international law we have left in this world, uh, simply because the diplomatic mission's uh, integrity, its sanctity has been violated. And this is such a serious violation that I, I you know, I just, just fathom, this is the one channel that even during times of war, uh, there needs to be some consideration on emissaries that are sent, um, you know, to negotiate peace or even talk about peace. And if they can't be even be secure, these diplomats, then we can't even begin to see where peace is. So this is probably the last straw. And, and let's not kid ourselves. This is a, a very serious action that unfortunately Iran had to take because it tried everything else in the past two weeks to try to address this in a manner that is most appropriate. Because if Iran did not address this, what it basically meant was anybody could go hit anybody's diplomatic missions and get away with it without even a slap on the wrist. And that's exactly what Israel was getting these past two weeks. So again, Iran is not only defending itself, it literally is defending the last bastion of international law or legal order as we know it. Right, indeed. How much do you think, uh, as far as the, this will be a uh, deterrence? Let me cross back over to uh, David Yacoubian. Uh, with this attack, uh, the retaliatory attack that has taken place tonight, and Iran has warned the Israeli regime about not upping the ante because they said that this was a limited response, but could be so much worse. Um, your thoughts, David, on the Israeli regime actually abiding by that or not? Fortunately, I have to say this really depends on how suicidal the Zionist elites are and uh, how little they care about their own population and the rest of humanity uh, relative to their Zionist colonialist project. Because I think we all know, of course, despite the fact that they continually lie about it, that Israel has an illegal arsenal of nuclear weapons. Um, they have threatened to use them even against the people of Gaza. So that that is is just simply insane on on you know by 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 uh, any uh, metrics or or level. Um, and so I think everyone is well aware that. Uh, and to your point about, unfortunately, that that military. Uh, might is necessary uh, because of the the failure and the the lack of effect of international law that 
uh, through conventional weapons, uh, collectively, the axis of resistance has the capacity to level the Zionist entity. Therefore, uh, th th I think it, it uh, revolves around the question of just how selfish and myopic and suicidal Zionist political elites are. And in response, unfortunately, uh, I, I don't, I feel confidently that we can state that uh, they are just engaging in brinksmanship. Based on the, the horrors of the last six months, in conjunction with the horrors that we've witnessed since 1948 occurring in occupied Palestine, I genuinely cannot provide uh, a, a solid answer regarding whether or not I believe that the Zionist entity will, will end up essentially committing suicide uh, for its, its inability to recognize the, the truly dramatic changes that have occurred globally um, and the fact that their project has finally shown itself to the world community uh, to be the hateful, ethnic cleansing, uh, uh, murderous apartheid regime that it is. Uh, observers of, of Zionism uh, could have told you this a long time ago, but after October 7th, uh, it has now become abundantly clear to the world community. Right. And also, I think, David, the complicity, though, of these Western regimes. I mean, if we, we go back uh, uh, in history and we look at, for example, United Nations Security Council and what it has done over the years, uh, whether we're talking about Libya and we know what happened with Libya and the no-fly zone, or whether we're talking about Syria and the chemical weapons. And I mean, so they have the ability to actually stop this entity if they wanted to, but they did not want to stop the Israeli genocide. So the complicity of this Western hegemonic front, I, I don't believe can or will ever be forgotten. Your thoughts, David? I, I uh, for certain, the United States enabled the genocide against the Palestinian people uh, that, that has uh, been ongoing since roughly October 8th. The United States is responsible for what happened since October 7th. Uh, the, the United States, I would say, is responsible for what has happened uh, in Israel, really going back to, you could say, 1967, uh, but uh, especially uh, after the Oslo peace process in 1993, in which uh, the United States, essentially serving as Israel's lawyer, increasingly took the side of the Zionist entity, prohibited the Oslo Accords from being advanced. Uh, and then, of course, after September 11th, uh, simply went ahead with its project for full spectrum dominance or global hegemony. Um, and so uh, Israel, this as they would refer to it, this unsinkable aircraft in the Middle East um, is the American proxy in the region to maintain tension and violence and arms sales and hatred and lack of economic production so that the resources can essentially be taken out the back door uh, in, in the interest of, of local comprador oligarchs. Uh, so th this is an American Zionist project. Uh, it, it's, it's often uh, interesting to hear uh, observers try to parse whether it's a Zionist American project or an American Zionist project, but I think that we mm. can put the two together here. They go hand in hand, it, this toxic mix of uh, Zionist colonialism and uh, the, the attempt to maintain American global hegemony, uh, even in light of the fact that this is completely unsustainable by uh, any metrics um, is doomed to failure. Uh, they, they're they're pushing it. They're they're going to test their exceptionalist luck. It seems, uh, and and we will be uh, finding out just how far they're they're willing to mm. to push. Well, we have some breaking news there. Biden says that we'll convene the G7 uh, for united diplomatic response to Iran. I I'm going to say with you, David, your thoughts on that uh, response. Uh, the G7 to convene for united diplomatic response to Iran. Well, isn't that interesting? The G7 is going to be a united diplomatic response because, of course, the United States only considers members of the G7 or its Atlanticist bloc. You can add in the Chinese and the Australians 
unfortunately, uh, to be relevant. This is what they refer to as the international community. Uh, I believe many of your viewers will have seen the true map of the international community of which they speak, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, roughly maybe about a fifth of the geographical uh, uh, scope of the globe and, and maybe one tenth of its population. So. Uh, the, the this this is typical. Um, the United States will appeal to its vassals uh, uh, to to uh, and I, I just say that because uh, I don't know that it has really what you could consider to be allies anymore. But it will appeal to its vassals for support. Um, they like clockwork will will likely uh, support the United States uh, and and the insanity of the uh, Biden administration. Um, we, we, we have have evidence of this by way of, of their approach to Ukraine and Russia. Uh, they're, they're, and this is not hyperbole. They seem absolutely incapable of making rational political decisions that will benefit security and their own populations and the global community. They are completely controlled by the United States uh, and take cues from the American government regarding what they should do in the effort to maintain American global hegemony. Uh, this this is falling apart as we speak, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. they will continue to toe the line. Very interesting. Well, <clears throat> said Moaz that we have other news from the New York Times now, citing Israeli official that Israel will coordinate with allies on response to Iran. Your thoughts? Um. You know, I, I mean, really, Iran, uh, Israel cannot function without uh, its allies uh, giving right. it its uh, car launch. As we know, the United States has done. Uh, here, I Iran has played this very smartly. Um, their communique has been very straightforward, saying that this is a measured response uh, against uh, the actions that took place about two weeks ago. In Syria, and that it should not escalate beyond that, and has warned uh, the United States to not get involved. Okay, unfortunately, uh, uh, said Moaz, unfortunately, our audio is not good. Uh, I'm going to ask and see if we can reestablish that connection and get a clearer line with you, said Moaz Shah, out of uh, Karachi. Hopefully. We will be able to reestablish a, a, a clearer line. Well, what about that, David? I mean, it, is it likely that the hegemonic front in general uh, would actually try to uh, uh, have a, a military response to Iran? I, uh, again, unfortunately, uh, it's hard for me to get it into the mind of insane imperialists sure. and Zionists because, <laughs> sure. really, really, because. Uh, observers ha have been at a loss to explain this, um, so uh, it it's difficult to predict. But if they have a modicum of sanity left, if they have a, a modicum of logic and intelligence, the Islamic Republic of